Yes, um, the presentation before was really on phylogenomics. Now it's getting much easier. It's uh, going about the uh, uh, DNA barcoding, which I will explain the technique, just in case not all of you are familiar with that. But uh, in, in short, we only deal with one gene, and even uh, more easy, we only deal with a mitochondrial gene. So um, in theory, we don't have uh, different alleles and hydrozygosity, et cetera. So um, different lessons, yes. First, I'd like to explain what FREDI stands for. FREDI stands for Freshwater Diversity Identification for Europe. And as you can uh, see from our beautiful logo, it's not only about fishes, and this is no shark, it should be a, a barb. Um, we are also, or we also worked with mayflies and uh, mollusks, and all of them only in the freshwater real realm of uh, Europe. So the project was uh, sponsored by the German Leibniz Association. It's a similar thing to, as uh, Max Planck, maybe you're more familiar with that. We had funding for three years, almost a million euros, and we had three different partners, um, two in Berlin, the IGB, who were working on the Mayflies with Michael Monaghan and a PhD student, Rainer Rutschmann, and the natural history museum in Berlin, um, who were working on the mollusks with uh, Matthias Glaubrecht, Thomas von Rintelen, and the PhD student, Katharina Kurzot. And I myself was uh, hired to coordinate the Fischberg package and also to coordinate the different groups um, situated in Bonn at the Museum König. And Fabian Herder is the, the principal investigator who um, acquired the grant for this project. And of course, Jörg Freihoff, you all might know him, or most of you, was involved. He had a half-time position for two years in this project to assist with coordinating, and myself. And then we had a bit of technical support from Bernhard Mies of the bioinformatics in the background and Peter Grobe for databasing. So um, what is DNA barcoding? Um, it is rather a vision than, than something really uh, tough um, to be able at some point to identify species or only parts of species or specimens um, to species level um, independent of the material. I think in the, in the talk later after me, we will hear something about environmental barcoding or identification of organisms from environmental samples. Um, I'm presenting on, on the, the basic of DNA barcoding, which uh, started in 2003. So how does it work? Usually you start with a, a specimen or a tissue of a specimen, and as we see more and more, it would be in an ideal work um, the holotype or material from the type series. As you can see here, a rough um, syntype of the Linnean uh, series, uh, fish skin dry mounted. You can imagine um, it is not allowed to take any scale of this paper, or it might eventually even be impossible to get a high quality DNR, DNA barcode because of the um, preservation technique. So this is dry mounted, it might work, I'm not sure, but we're not allowed to take. So now, if we describe species, we usually automatically produce a DNA barcode from the type material to, to um, like make a later identification for colleagues much easier. Then you extract the DNA, you do a PCR amplification of the barcode locus. Um, so in the animal kingdom, this is the mitochondria CO1, and then you put all those barcodes, 658 base pairs long, into uh, a database, a kind of reference library we are talking about. And the idea then is that each species is characterized by certain positions in its barcode and can be identified via these positions um, or can be like discriminated from other species or individuals that do not have those um, mutations or insertions, deletions. So 
in the future, if, if you have a complete reference library, so once you have all the species, the ideas, that you can identify anything from like water, I think this will be the next talk, but also to, you can detect food fraud, you can detect what uh, your tuna species was likely, and the, the early vision was that all this will be combined in a single handheld device, so the, my generation, or the maybe a bit older, might know this three-quarter, tricorder, um, Captain Kirk, Star Trek, and this was already formulated in 2003, so more than 10 years ago, and now it seems that we are really getting somewhere near there. So you all can imagine a smartphone has a quite nice computing power, you have four cores, or even the newer smartphones have eight cores, you have a quite nice amount of um, RAM and everything. And now we have also um, DNA sequencing technology in the size of like a cigarette box, as you see. And some weeks ago, it was announced that for, for selected laboratories, they're giving this out, this single um, DNA strand sequencing technology. So you just plug it in via USB and give you a probe in there and get your DNA sequenced. But this is kind of a beta or prototype, but it shows that we really, maybe in 10 years, will have something which we can take out into the field to, to analyze DNA from. So um, what to do with this then? Um, one really important aspect I had to learn this um, also was uh, to link life history stages. I did not know that most of the mayfly species are either described based on the adult or based on the larvae, and no one knows exactly the link. So no one knows, or not many know, how does the larvae look to the adult, or how does the female look for this male. And using DNA barcoding, we can now link we can link the egg with the larvae and the adult, if we have the material. And we can discriminate cryptic species, so species that are very similar at a first glance. And an interesting study was published two or three years ago um, where they analyzed stomach contents from leeches, so leeches that feed them on the blood of mammals. They did this, I think it was in Taiwan, in a national park, and they really detected the complete mammal um, species that live in these forests and even detected some more species that did, they did not know live in this area because those animals are very secretive and hard to observe. And it was really an impressive study. Um, falls under biodiversity monitoring. Of course, we discover new species. So if we find any um, um, discrepancies between our barcode data and the, that what the taxonomists identified, then this is a good hint that we have to look closer and often discover new species. Um, the same way identify taxonomical problems. Um, the customs has a new tool or the custom to identify cited species. And of course, the analysis of herbals, honey, meat, seafood helps in detecting uh, food fraud. But all this uh, relies on um, reference libraries. So we, at the moment, are still activating the taxonomic experts to deliver us well-identified material, and we generate the barcodes of that. Um, there is a best practice we follow, of course, so we want to have all data. We usually accept only material stored at the Natural History Museum, so either here or in Germany or in Madrid. Um, then we publish the sequence at some point, so this has to be bear in mind, and we need additional information. Then everything will be put on the web portal. Unfortunately, it's not uh, ready now, so it is only um, a portal that brings um, information about the project, but has no functionality so far, but will be implemented soon, I hope. Um, and of course, we cooperate with this uh, national DNA barcoding campaign, iBowl. They're situated in Canada, and they had the ambitious goal to create DNA barcodes for 500,000 species. At the moment, they have 150,000 species, and they are still confident to reach their goal. I'm, I'm not sure, but yes. Um, what was our geographic coverage, our focus? Um, in the beginning, 
quite ambitious enough, we started with this map and tried to generate species lists, so a kind of what do we want in a perfect world. And we ended up for the European freshwater fishes. This was based on the Cotillant and Freihof 2007 species list, the handbook on European freshwater fishes. We ended up with something like 600 species. And I have a second figure here. This is because we expanded, because um, the European fish network is quite collaborative and really effective. And so we were really able to expand further here and here. I will show that later. Um, for the mayflies, we had a target list of about 350 species, and for the mollusks, 270. But um, those exclude some groups. So compared to the fishes, the taxonomic um, status, so the, 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 the working status of these two groups is, really, groups is really poor compared to the fishes. So as I said before, we kind of expanded for the fishes and managed to get um, something over a thousand species already, um, more than 10,000 DNA barcodes that I'm currently analyzing. And thus we are now an, an important contributor to the Fish Barcode of Life initiative. And the last figure I had was that there are about one third of the 30,000 plus um, fish species have a DNA barcode, so there's still a lot of work to do. And in the meanwhile, the German Barcode of Life project started. This is where I am working now, and they are like contributing or continuing um, financing the Freddy project, which is quite nice. So, of course, this uh, did not work with a big net of collaborators. So on our webpage, you will find about 60 ichthyologists from Europe and neighboring countries and with different benefits. So it showed, as you would expect, that most of them were happy to cooperate for co-authorships, but some of them and were also happy to receive some funding to go into the field and collect. So as an example, so the Eastern European countries it was quite, um, quite easy with um, little financial investment to get nice species sets from those countries. We had big problems with bureaucracy in Greece and Romania, and it was really, really more expensive than expected and compared to the other countries. But um, therefore, it was very um, fruitful. So we got many species, yeah. Um, how does that look in the field? Just a short note, we usually aim to get seven specimens per population, per species. Usually, if there are not many species at one place, we collect many more. Um, but seven was like the minimum. If they're small enough, we preserve them in the pure ethanol. If they're larger, then we preserve them in formalin and uh, take a fin clip. And very important, and some colleagues had to learn that, um, that we need the link to the specimen that was, especially in the past, many ichthyologists did not work like that. So we got uh, lots of materials from the eastern countries where we don't have the link. So you get a tube with 20 fin clips and you get a bag with 20 fishes and then it's okay for barcoding, but then if you discover something interesting, you cannot go back to the specimen. So if you work in the field, please keep this link one one. Um, of course, a bit of logistic is involved, um, just a snapshot or shot of a list, and this is no problem if um, you have a, a minivan, as you see. But on our first trip, for example, we only had these Opel Insignia from the IGB Institute, which was nice for driving, but it was really a pain, especially if you handle large amounts of formalin. Um, this is not so so nice. And then if you had like 31 degrees in uh, southern Italy, it kind of smells rapidly in the car. So just to, to show some colleagues without those, um, the Italy tours would not have been possible. Stefano Porcellotti, Cesare Pucci, Gianni Beda and Mastro, they um, really made these, we made two tours to Italy a great success. And just one example I was not familiar with, Italy houses, or in Italy, there are 
three different endemic barbel species, one of them um, already threatened, small um, barbus caninos, and we were happy to find all of them. But we already noticed in the field that identification is not so straightforward, and that was known for beforehand that also the Central European Barbus Barbus, it should be in Sweden as well, I think, maybe introduced, um, has managed to, to come to Italy, most likely through um, anglers, because this species grows like double the size or even more than the, the natives in Italy. And we had a master student who did, in addition to the DNA barcodes we generated, looked at uh, nuclear markers, which was unfortunately not so easy because barbels are tetraploid, and this is really a mess. So we managed only to get good data for one nuclear marker. And, but what we found is that there were many, many more introgressed specimens or hybrids than we identified um, in the field. And then we did some, um, so we did X-rays and geometric morphometrics and traditional meristics and morphological analysis. And we showed that this is in no way correlated. So what we see and what was documented also last year in another publication is that usually the, the larger species is the female donor. So, and as those species are all smaller, they are attracted by the larger barbus um, females. So you have kind of a unidirectional introgression. Another phenomenon is that the, the larger barbus barbus forces the smaller species into the higher regions of the streams. So usually those two are the less rheophilic species in Italy that live in the bigger rivers, but now we observe that the barbus like pushes those into the, the smaller streams where usually barbus caninus um, used to live, and now we also observe hybrids between these three species. So very interesting, and um, just one result from a barcoding study. Um, other interesting findings here, two roach species in Italy um, exist, then the Salmo marmorata, the famous um, marble trout, was very impressive to see. There are not many pure populations left, as I was told. Um, on the second trip, because we had some time left, we, we went straight down Italy and we're looking for this endemic um, trout in Sicily, what we found, unfortunately, there were five places reported where this uh, species should live. Um, two rivers were completely dry. We don't, it might be that it's kind of a natural situation, but usually and you find somewhere still water. But we, what we observed was most likely linked to, to the growing of um, oil, for example, oil trees. So there is a, too much water taken on. But then we found some, at least in a small portion, and we're quite happy to find that they are also distinctive, only little, based on the barcode marker. And on the way back, we visited a nice place, a Fossa Calda, um, which is a natural warm spring with an interesting fauna. <laughs> um, of course, tilapia, then this uh, Amatitlania, or or convict cichlids from Central America. And what was interesting, these um, pterygoplistic sucker mouse catfish, they are obviously so happy that they reproduce in this stream, which is uh, like the first record of natural reproduction of a armored catfish outside or inside Europe this way. So that it's reported from other places in the world, but for Europe, this is the first record that they really reproduce. And this, this is a, a natural thermal source, and um, we, we expect that they will keep their stable. It's not like in Germany, we have a, a power plants where there is a warm water outlet where we also have, for example, convicts and tilapias, but they are not really um, stable because when the power plant shuts down, the species will disappear. So that's different in Italy. Yeah, just um, to mention, in case you're wondering about the beautiful fish pictures, this is uh, Jörg Freihoff's work, who is very impatient if you don't do it correctly. So 
This is our Mollusk student. Yes, highly recommended. Um, later in the year, we went to Greece. It was a very long tour, 8,000 kilometers, and hired, like this is the fish group, Maria Stumpudi. She was the former president of the uh, European Ichthyological Society and her colleagues, Roberta Barbiera, Eline Calogiani, and Costas Grizales, who is a macro zoo pentos expert um, who was uh, collecting with us. And one interesting finding we did not expect was a new species of um, these highly endangered Valencia killifishes. Um, we just discovered or we found one specimen in the field and did at first glance not really um, see that it's a Valencia. Um, but it turned out to be really strange from its barcode, as you can see here. So we had three groups, and only two species were known in, in Europe, or two species. And then we did some, some research, and it turned out that the, the German Killifish Association and colleagues in, in Austria and the Czech Republic were keeping these stocks since years in their aquaria and thought that this is a Valencia Letornoixi. And then uh, Jörg had a closer look at some morphological features and um, color marks and found something to like really diagnostic features and so we described this species. Very nice finding. Yeah, and some more interesting findings. Um, I'm coming to them. For example, this uh, Caspiomyzum grecus, a, a, a lamprey species um, that was thought to be more or less extinct in the wild. Um, the colleague from this Hellenic center told us that there might be a population left, and indeed they found those um, larvae and adults, interestingly. But as you can see here, um, this Kefali, Kefalari spring is already heavily impacted by, by human activities. So we observed um, carps that certainly don't live there. And again, barbel species, we are not sure if they occur there naturally. And people feeding those fishes, uh, children playing there. So it's kind of only, only um, a matter of time since, until this population will, will maybe go extinct. Another example for this um, mismanagement of water resources, we were looking here for a a chub species that was already known, that it is a bit distinct from the other chubs in this region. So they went there and <laughs> did not find a lot of water. And uh, Roberta already said, why it's uh, not worth going down, let's uh, go on. But still, there were some um, individuals left. And interestingly, when they hiked down the river, they found like lots of these small um, water remnants, and they were full of these fishes. Or not really full, but there were many of them. And this is, could be an indication that this population um, has some kind of adaptation. So it would certainly be worth uh, a little project to investigate them. Um, yes, we, like at the Beginning of the project, we were thinking about um, will we collect DNA barcodes until the end and then try to publish something big, or is there a possibility to make a, a meaningful um, cut in the middle? And so we decided to focus um, at the beginning on the Mediterranean biodiversity hotspot, um, which is characterized or defined by the floral zone, the Mediterranean floral zone. So we generated a species list, and we were able to, to get 98% uh, of the species that should live in this area, which was quite nice. And we wanted to, because we, we were not sure how well does this DNA barcoding approach work for our um, fauna. So we tested uh, different approaches, and the most standard DNA barcoding is, approach is just the distance-based criteria. So you, you merely you just count the differences between DNA sequences, and 
do a clustering according to that. And we were quite surprised that um, the success rate of this simple approach is really so bad. So only half of the species in this, um, in this region could be identified unambiguously using this approach. And the reasons were that there is no barcode gap. And you can see this here. So in black, you have the, um, the genetic differentiation um, within a species and in gray between species. And you see this broadly overlaps. And this leads um, to the situation that many, many species cannot be, not be distinguished by their next relatives. Um, another problem is that we had a quite comprehensive taxonomic and geographic and coverage. So in many barcoding studies where much higher success rates are supported, they only focus on like a small subset and then often they don't have the sister taxa in there. So you miss out diversity and then uh, the success rate increases. And also we observe a kind of taxonomic burden. So this federal structure of of Europe um, led, we think, in many cases to like double descriptions of, of the same species. So in one country, the species is named like this, and in one country like that. But um, we cannot like solve these problems by a simple barcoding approach. And introgression, recent speciation, we were uh, surprised that these cases of introgression are really rare. But so it was less than 2%, I think. Um, and reportedly, it should be around 10% in freshwater fishes, or differs the numbers. And this, we think, is linked to that we only use very typical specimens. So we did not do a random sampling. We chose really representatives for species. Um, the second approach was um, just to count how many of those uh, species turn out to be monophyletic. And this was much better. So many more species turned out to be identifiable if you, um, if you choose the monophyly criterion. Um, but also this varied a lot between the groups. And it is, of course, threshold dependent. So we were thinking about do we only count nodes with bootstrap support higher than something? And then we dropped this because we were sure that the reviewer will like, uh, ask us, why did you choose this threshold? So we just um, chose no threshold. And it was accepted. Of course, still problematic um, introgression and very recent speciation. Here, one example from um, Lake Busco in, I think, Croatia, where the spawning grounds of um, these species have been destroyed. And this led to the situation that all of these three species share the same mitochondria, or at least this is reported. And this is what we find. So or what we also found is that on the barcode locals, all these three species are indistinguishable. But um, probably no analytical approach will help to resolve this. And the last approach, a GMYC model approach, um, it was, was best in terms of congruence between species and clusters. It also varied between group. And we found that the multiple threshold model, which is not looking for a single transition in the tree, but allows for various transitions. So maybe here and here and here, similar to what uh, Tom Neer showed before. Um, here, the congruence between species um, a priori identified and these barcode units was highest. Um, this has a really big drawback, which is the computational demand. So Tom Neer said before eight years, it's not so bad, but if you would <laughs> try to analyze the whole data set with like 2,000 haplotypes, um, this would take several months. So we already had to do this in a reasonable time to divide the data set into smaller taxonomic groups and then without the a cluster, this would not have been possible to, to analyze. So you cannot do this on a desktop computer. And this is a big problem. And then again, singletons, how do you treat them here is a big problem. And again, introgression, there is no help on the analytic side. 
Um, in the meantime, this was, I think, one year ago or something, the colleagues from this uh, international barcoding initiative, they presented uh, their BIN system barcode index number, which has, according to, to the uh, recent publications, the same accuracy of this approach, but is like a, a magnitude faster. So now we have, apparently we have a good analytical tool. Unfortunately, you can only use this if you put all your data on the bold um, database, which uh, you're not so happy about that because this is connected to, to efforts and you kind of lose control over your data. So we usually prefer to put our data on bold when we are ready and when we are done with everything. So some conclusions. Um, the analytical approach, I showed the tree-based methods are superior to the distance-based approaches. Um, nonetheless, people should um, continue to report these very basic distance statistics because this is really, this gives you a, a feeling for the data and you can quickly compare your, your numbers to those of, for example, if there is a study published on the uh, Amazonian um, tributary and they say they had so many specimens and species and so many distance-based clusters on 2%. This gives you a, an easy way to compare their diversity to, to what you might have done. Introgressions, yeah, I said 1.4%. I, I explained that before. This is quite little. Um, and we think this was linked to, to our strategy to only choose um, typical individuals. Um, we found the effect of taxonomic geographic sample. I explained that. And what we think is what we also observed is um, a problem with, um, with the barcode libraries. As they grow and grow and grow and you include more and more very closely species and you come to the situation where you rather like include subpopulations and what was former called subspecies, um, it, will be, it will be harder and harder to tell to say this cluster is this species. And then we come back to what we were aiming at, type material, or go and visit the type locations and attach really the barcode only to this type locality population. Um, in fishes, it's, it's working at the moment as it is, but for the mollusks, for example, we have for this European um, Unio muscle, there are more than 200 synonyms and there is no way to, to solve this without going. Usually, you would now have to go to every single type locality also of the synonyms. Otherwise, you cannot, you cannot, well, people do it, but it's not, <laughs> um, um, it's not really um, scientifically, scientifically well founded to just collect uh, something and attach the name to this barcode, if you know there are 200 synonyms in the background. So, um, what we, on the other hand, showed, which um, gives me some hope and um, still makes me confident that DNA barcoding is a good approach, is that it does well work on kind of local communities. So, as I showed before, if we analyze all the species and all the specimens together, um, big problem is that the barcode gap is missing. But if we just look at species sets, we did this here from the, the, um, the Orontes and the Vardar and the Po River in Italy, with like small species sets, 40 species, 70 species, um, then the accuracy is well above 90%, 99%. So we only had in the Po, I think, a problems with the two trout species that might be due to stocking already or no one knows then we had problems with this alosa. There's a resident alosa form in Lake Garda and one in the Po drainage and they, maybe this is a thing of recent speciation or already introgression, we don't know. But if you just focus on the local species, assemblage DNA barcoding really is, is great to identify what you have in there. Um, Yeah, overall we were surprised. So we found 64 populations or species that deserved a second look. So as, for example, these uh, new Valencia species. 
And this was kind of surprising because the Mediterranean region has a long, long history and tradition of, of ichthyological research. So um, in some species, we are not surprised. For example, the small killifish, Afanius mento, there was a huge geographical structure. And for some of them, there were already synonyms that might be resurrected now. Um, for example, also these uh, rheophilic gudgeon, Romanogomio banarescui. When we saw it in the field, it was clear that it's different from its sister, Romanogomios elimaios. So we resurrected them. And then we found uh, 36, uh, 36 species with a yeah, very obvious degree of cryptic genetic diversity. And now we would need like students who do morphological analysis. And then um, a very last point is we were thinking about how to, to make more use of DNA barcode data. And we found this um, edge approach that was invented or presented by colleagues from the London Zoo. And they propose in addition, or not in addition, but to to prioritize species for conservation, and they propose to include a phylogenetic diversity, or they call it evolutionarily distinctiveness. It's really a bad word, bad word. And uh, together, it's called edge, evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered. And we were interested in if we can use DNA barcode data for that, because there are several examples for amphibians, for example, but those guys use phylogeny similar to what Tom Neer presented based on really several markers. So where you say this is a sound phylogenetic hypothesis, usually DNA barcoding and phylogenetics is not the best combination. Um, but we were very surprised to see that if we derive these evolutionarily distinctiveness values from um, these simple trees that we generate based on DNA barcode data, that was a highly linked, highly significant. And this now would mean we can predict or we can give um, recommendations for certain species that have not been assessed by IOCN um, to put into any category. So the problem is not, or only a fraction of the species has been assessed. Freshwater fishes in Europe, I don't have the number, but there's only a fraction that fall into any of the category and many of them are data deficient. So now we could use these growing, growing DNA barcoding data and like predict where they would be falling. And that was an interesting finding. And it might be that we will uh, continue in this way. And then I would be at the end, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Matthias. Questions? Yes, this one up there. How do we do? Well, from contamination, you can do that in the, uh, in the, in the lab, of course. You have to, to work carefully. And if you find something in progression, um, like, then you go back to the documentation. And if that does not help, then you have to check if in the neighboring well there was this donor species. And then, of course, this is suspicious. But you, of course, you have to check that, yeah. Any other questions? I was wondering, um, can you tell from your huge sample now of 650 species and perhaps 60 more, how many of those are endangered? How many of those are endangered? Um, I think it's 40%. So not the highest threat category, but those what is endangered. Uh, I think in the Mediterranean, it was something like 40%. So almost one and a half, yeah. So it was about time that this was done. Well, yeah. It was. All right, one moment. So, 
with that, I express the thanks for, from the Natural History Museum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.